Uh, the year that I was born, 1911. I was born in 1912. 1908. 1926 in Dunellen, Florida. 1922. 1923. I was born in St. Louis. My mother delivered me in Barnes Hospital in the basement. And that was because everything was segregated when I was born in 1927. One often wonders about people when you first meet them. Uh, what has happened during their life to make them the person that they are today. Our entire life, especially my school and even my college years, was subjected to segregation. I remember passing two white schools to get to my colored school. Black children were taught by black teachers white children were taught by white teachers. Everything was separate and everything was not equal. And it is that concept of everything being separate but nothing being equal that we're going to focus on today in our History in the First Person program, Living Under Jim Crow Laws. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore and I'm very happy to welcome you to the Black Box Theater here at Ledoux Horton Watkins High School where we're being joined by a group of students here who are juniors and seniors at Ledoux High School and as always by kids across the country joining us via the web or video conference. You, of course, are part of the conversation too. So if you want to send us your questions at any time during the program, email them to us at live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We look forward to working them into our program. Uh, Babe Ruth uh, was toward the end of his career in 1933 and uh, I decided I wanted to see Babe Ruth because at the time he was the most spectacular player in the world <laughs> in baseball. So uh, one day I, when the, the Yankees were here and he was going to play, uh, I decided I should go and see him. At that time I was probably um, eight or nine, ten maybe. Uh, 1933 I was ten. Okay. I, <laughs> Uh, so I, I lived uh, in the Ville. I uh, walked over to uh, what is now Martin Luther King, what then was Easton Avenue, and uh, the Wellston Streetcar ran uh, on Easton Avenue. I caught the Wellston Streetcar at uh, Pendleton Avenue and rode it down to Grand Avenue, uh, where, where I could then catch the Grand Avenue Streetcar and go north uh, to Sportsman's Park, which was over in the north part of the city, uh, beyond uh, St. Louis Avenue. As I got on, of course, the, the, the streetcar was pretty well packed with uh, adults and big people. But in one little seat, there was a little boy who had come up from South St. Louis, a uh, white boy, and he was, uh, you know, he looked crouched down and uh, because with all these big people all around, he was a little worried. So I went over and sat next to him, and we both that <laughs> uh, that you know got strength from each other. <clears throat> when we got out to the park, we went around to where we always went uh, to the uh, uh, the um, side of the park uh, where the third base was. Where the where the, they had a, a section for not old people. When we got to, to got ready to go in there, the, the man at the at the gate said, "No, no, no, around that way." So we we walked around to the other side, and uh, where the bleachers were, and uh, when we got there, he looked at us and said, "No, no, no, back around that way." So when we got back around the other way, the guy said. Now you, you didn't know what you were doing. And he reached down and got the little white boy, pulled him in and told me to go around to the other side. <laughs> that was the first time I knew anything about that. Uh, but uh, that was my experience on that particular So in very specific ways, yeah. here was the entrance for the black kid and here was yeah. the entrance for the white yeah. kids. Yeah. There were Negro League baseball teams in St. Louis at the time as oh, well, yes. were there not? Yeah. And we got an email question that came in. Was it an integrated audience that went to the Negro League games? Did, were they didn't play at Sportsman Park normally. 
but there would be, uh, if they had played, there would, would have been. Most of the uh, Negro League uh, games were down in a stadium on Broadway. And it's no, that no longer there. Now, uh, much smaller, yeah. Lois Jean. Uh, I want to add an addendum to oh, that. Oh, go right ahead. Because uh, Tandy Park, remember yeah. the Tandy Park across from mm -hmm. Sumner High School? That was really a Sunday outing. Yeah. And the fellows would be playing uh, baseball. They had formed teams. And so one team was playing against the other team. Now, that team might be a team from someplace east of the ville, and the other team would be a ville-oriented mm -hmm. team. And that was a Sunday outing. We went there with picnic baskets and jugs of Kool-Aid. No, Kool-Aid was not uh, lemonade and stuff <laughs> like that. And our mothers had made sandwiches, and we sat around uh, Tandy Park watching that game. It was it was just a great Sunday outing for Different the family. Different from a lot of Sundays today, probably, yes. for folks. To go back to Perry's question about discrimination as a child, you and I, Lois Jean, had a chance to talk earlier in the program, and you speak about this a little bit in the documentary as well as about an experience you had in a church environment. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think that might be surprising to kids, even in a church environment, how you face segregation. That was a very unpleasant situation for me. I was Catholic. I'm no longer Catholic. But um, in the church that I went to that was in my neighborhood, but was a white church. And uh, the people who went to that church used up all the seats. And those seats that they didn't use up, we didn't have them either. Because black people only had three pews in the northeast side of the church. Now, if there were more black Catholics coming, they just had to stand up, even though there would be empty pews around us. One day, on a Saturday, because I'm Catholic, and I was Catholic, let me change that to past tense, I was Catholic, and on Saturday I'd go to confession. You had to do that in order to take communion on Sunday. When I asked the priest who was in the confessional, why do we always have to sit in the back of the church? He said, because that's where you belong. When I went home and told my, oh, and then he said, and don't ever ask that question again. Now you say three Hail Marys, the act of contrition, and don't ever ask that question again. When I went home and told my father about it, he said, Lois, you will not have to go to that church anymore. So on Sunday mornings, my brothers and I went to St. Elizabeth's Church, which was on Pine Street, and that was east of Grand Avenue, and out of the community of the Ville. I think that's an important story for kids to hear because you would frequently think that a church environment would be one of the places maybe where you did not have to face that. Yes. We had the chance a couple of years ago to speak to a woman named Carmel Hill for another program we did about Catholic education in St. Louis, and here's her story. My father and my grandmother would go to church together. There were lots of masses because there were a lot of people. My father and my grandmother would go to church. My father is very light. My grandmother is more of my complexion. They would say to my father, move up to the front. And they would say to my grandmother, well, you need to sit back here. People, black sat in the back of church. I never sit in the back of church because of that experience. But that's what was going on in the Catholic church. When my grandmother wanted to join organizations within the church, she was made to feel uncomfortable. However, my grandmother was one of those people who you could not make her feel uncomfortable. She was going to join. So she joined the Ladies' Sodality. And there were times when um, whites would say, well, if I touch you, I get good luck. So those kinds of attitudes were in existence in the, the late 40s and the 50s. So it gives you a couple of specific examples from the religious perspective, but I want to go back up to Maine again, because I know, Megan, you've got a question for uh, Mr. McAllister about his uh, times at the YMCA. 
Mr. McAllister, when you first started at the YMCA as a youth, were they segregated at the time? If so, how are the white YMCA and black YMCAs different? I don't think they were any different. <laughs> they were pretty much uh, based on the same uh, basis of what they wanted to do. And the, the separation part was just neighborhood in those days. We uh, walked, you know, so the Pine Street YMCA here in St. Louis was located downtown, which at the time it was uh, built in uh, 1917, uh, was the center of the major black uh, uh, area, which was south then of Grand Avenue. Uh, after the First World War, uh, people began to move uh, out into the Ville and the West End. And uh, so uh, when I was a kid, we had a, a little small YMCA for boys mainly around the corner from where we lived uh, on Pendleton Avenue, across from what was then Poor Old College. Uh, incidentally, Poor Old College, we never say much about, but it was a major thing in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Mrs. Malone, who founded it, supposedly paid the highest income tax in Missouri in 1927. And he's referring to Annie Malone, <coughs> uh, yeah. a tremendous right. uh, a woman with tremendous uh, uh, yeah. benefits here in the St. Louis area, well, the first African-American female millionaire, if I remember yeah, history correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the, you mentioned in the course of that answer that there was a separation largely by neighborhood, and this might yeah. be an interesting thing to bring up for the students. They may not have this history dealing with housing covenants and how that you guys as kids might not have realized this, obviously, yeah. at 8, 10, 14, oh, sure. but that real estate agents actually made sure that areas that had been traditionally black stayed traditionally black right. and other areas that had been traditionally white stayed traditionally white. Mm -hmm. We've got an image of uh, the Shelley House. There's a, a sup famous Supreme Court case known as Shelley versus Kramer. It's the house on the left. This house actually exists just on the outskirts of the Ville. And it was the Shelley family who wanted to move into this house when a man named Kramer uh, decided he was going to sue them because they, he believed it violated a restricted housing mm -hmm. covenant. And so in that case eventually went to the Supreme Court who decided at that point that such covenants were unenforceable. That was well into the late 1940s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to say well, a couple of other things. One, in terms of what you just mentioned, uh, it wasn't quite that defined. Uh, the Ville, for instance, had been uh, German, before we had moved there, uh, before our invasion, let's say, from below Grand Avenue had happened, and that was before I was born. But <clears throat> some were still left there. The couple who was quite old, uh, three houses from, from where I lived on North Market, a couple named Woodhead uh, lived. Uh, the corner store on one corner was a German guy, I forgot, uh, uh, Mr. Loving Guts. Loving Guts, <laughs> right. And so, you know, there were some older whites who mm -hmm. stayed, didn't, in stayed in their homes, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, not many, <laughs> not many at all. Well, let's, let's age you a little bit, not too quickly, mm -hmm. but you, you grow up, you go to Sumner High School, both yes. gr graduates yes. of Sumner High School, mm -hmm. which yes. of course the first African-American high school mm -hmm. west of the Mississippi River, yes. uh, a very famous high school who has a lot of very famous graduates if you want to find out more about it. Um, and you go off to college and eventually to the military yeah. for, for you, Mr. McAllister. So some students have some questions about those parts of your life as well. So we'll go back to Warsaw Middle School again. Nolan, let's ask your question. We've learned a bit about discrimination, so we'll just deal with, with during, the, uh, after serving World War II. Did you deal with any direct discrimination after serving in the war? <laughs> so, so let's talk first of all a little bit about your military experience yeah. and then we can talk about it afterwards. You'd gone to, to Stowe Teachers College yeah. for a period of time, yeah. and then was it in 1943 you joined the military? Uh, you know, yeah. Somewhere about then? And so. Talk a little bit about your military experience. Were you in a segregated unit? Because this was before, obviously, Truman desegregates the yeah, military. Yeah, right. Uh, well, when I went to basic training, which you had to go to when you started going into the, the uh, Army in those days, uh, they sent us to, well, well in the first place, <laughs> when, you, when you got ready to go into the Army here in St. Louis, you went down to Jefferson Barracks. 
blacks only went on Saturday to Jefferson Barracks <laughs> to be inducted. I didn't realize that at the time. Uh, we were inducted and sworn in, and uh, a group that I was with went then to Fort Leonard Wood here in Missouri, and it was a, uh, uh, a segregated affair there with uh, all blacks in the unit. Uh, we, uh, fortunately, just at the end of that, when that unit was going to be assigned to, to, uh, to Europe to dig graves, uh, the ASTP began. Now that began ASTP Army Specialized Training Program. That began because they wanted to take out of the service at that point uh, young men who had been in college just before they went, uh, before they uh, signed up. And they put them together at various places around the country and then assigned them to, to universities uh, where they would take uh, courses that would be useful in the Army. Some people were assigned to take foreign languages uh, where in anticipation of being, a, you know, the, being fighting in some place where you needed to speak the language. And others like me were assigned to uh, places where they were teaching engineering uh, so you could help with the guns and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> I was assigned to, uh, to uh, the University of Nebraska. Uh, and uh, let's see, I started there in June of 43. I had gone to the Army in March of 43 and was assigned to the University of Nebraska, where I took then from June, 1st of June, to uh, the uh, middle of January. Uh, when they stopped ASTP suddenly, uh, I now realize the reasons for the sudden stop was that uh, Eisenhower was already calculating how he was going to invade on D-Day, which was the 6th of June, uh, I believe it was the 6th, uh, 1944. However, uh, while I was at the University of Nebraska, I realized I was the only black person there at the time. Uh, and I didn't, you know, it didn't occur to me. But the reason that they thought I was white was because my, my uh, uh, birth certificate said so. And my birth certificate said so because I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> and the doctor who uh, treated my mother at the time was a white doctor because there weren't, there weren't any black doctors there at the time in 1923. And so his I'm assuming that his secretary or whatever could never saw us. <laughs> and so when she, he told them to send the birth certificates into the state, why they wrote white on all of them, you know, so. Automatic, so Automatic, to speak. right. So that's why <clears throat> that was. And so when they discovered that, and I said, oh yes, I'm black. I, I'm, uh, well, in those days, I'm colored. That's what they used to say. And, uh, so they said, okay, we'll take care of that. As when you leave here, you go to another black unit, which they did. We want to give the kids some perspective about one of the most serious impacts of this, which was the prospect of lynching. And that is specifically mentioned in the very powerful documentary from Jim Crow to Barack Obama that Denise Ward Brown has put together. And this particular excerpt gives with, deals with a story about Sykes in Missouri. The last uh, lynching here, I remember Missouri, was down here in the Sykes uh, in the early 40s. I knew of the lynching that happened here in Saxton, Missouri. Can you tell me about that? There was a black man, and he was going with this white school teacher, and they found out about him going with this white woman. They killed him, they lynched him, they tarred and feathered him, and drove him through the streets of Saxton. And today, when they say sex, it just kind of does something to me. Because I, you know, I always go reflect back to that lynching that they did for that man. It was in the newspaper. Show the pictures of the man lying in the street, tarred and feathered, and the dogs were around him. Young fellow, he was a young man, a young man. And there were thousands of lynching that happened, mostly in the South. 
one might call that the most extreme example of the criminal justice system at the time, but could either of you speak to just your nature of inter interactions you had in the criminal justice system or your sense of fair play that would have been at play at the criminal justice system at the time? That Was there a worry amongst your friends, for example, that interaction with the police would automatically be different for you than it would be for a white person? Mm -hmm. I see lots of head nodding going on, oh, yeah. William. Oh, sure. <clears throat> that, that's true. Who still is? Pretty much uh, anywhere. That some differences, and I suppose from another point of view, it's still, that's true too. Uh, with black policemen, I might treat whites a little, uh, some say that, I don't know how true it is, but in any case, that's so. Um, but uh, not as like it was. <laughs> Nothing like it was, because you don't want to get sued, and you, don't, you know, particularly if you can prove that this guy did you wrong. Uh, you can generally come out all right. <clears throat> and Lois Jean, do you have? Yes, um, I just have to start off by saying during that heavy time of lynching, black folks had no sanctuary. The whites who hated African, people of African descent, hated us so badly that they would say, uh, perhaps something like the code word picnic, meaning let's pick a N-word, and that's what they did on a Sunday afternoon. There would be hundreds of them around, and a lynching is a, a terrible thing to see, but the result of the lynching is what is even worse, because after the man and some women were lynched too, not just men. But after the lynching, and you see that limp body hanging and the head leaning to the left with the big knot in the rope on the side of their head, it's terrible. The humor is not funny if it's hurting. You know, it may be funny to that person who's saying a joke, but if, it's, if the humor is at the risk of my feelings, that's not funny. And so I think it's a way to, for other people to realize that uh, all people have feelings, uh, no one wants to be abused, no one wants to be made fun of, and it, it's just best to respect everyone. So, Ms. Turner, to take the question a little bit more of a, a different direction as well, talk about just the impact of being able to tell your story why you think it's important to share stories like that, and a little bit maybe of your, as we get toward the end of the program here, a little bit of your response to the impact of the civil rights movement and where you see society now and where we still need to go. I would hope that those who see uh, the documentary that has been presented, has been produced by Denise, I hope that they'll recognize the fact that prejudice and discrimination hurts on both sides. It hurts the person on whom the discrimination is meted out, but it also hurts that person who is giving it out, the discrimination is giving it out to it. I don't want this person next to me. I don't want that person in my area. I want to live in an enclave I recognize this, Tim, because I was so sheltered as a young child, as a young adult, and only when I got out into the open area and had the relationships with other people who were different from me did I realize how much it hurts when you say something about someone you don't even know. So I would think that Denise has really opened my eyes by having me as a part of this documentary because now I look at people with different eyes. So I don't say that, that there's anybody who is wrong, but I said, I think to myself, well, I bet I did that when I was young. So I don't become too critical of young adults because young adults are only doing what this old lady did when she was a young adult. 
-hmm. And Mr. McAllister, when you were a young adult, mm -hmm. any other thoughts you'd like to share in a general way that way? Yeah, I think uh, everybody has his own experience, you know. Uh, you uh, know, but at the base of everything is the fact that human beings are human beings. I don't care where they're from or who they are, and they all need to be respected. That's what you learn. I, I, I know that all out through the world, there are these kind of problems. Now we, have, we had one of the larger problems because we came out of slavery you know, it was only 1865 when we came out of slavery. You, can, you think about that and say, my goodness, that wasn't too long ago. <laughs> so so we had to go through these, this, these periods of change. We now in the United States have gone all the way as far as the, the law is concerned. Now I know that there, there are people still trying to influence the law in little, little ways to keep folks from voting and all that kind of thing. And uh, some, of, some of that is working here and there. People are doing that. But uh, eventually we know we will get rid of that. We got rid of most of it already. And I think eventually we'll get rid of all, uh, all of it. Well, uh, and that's an important part of just the movement continuing to go forward. Well, As you mentioned that very specifically, it's yeah. like it's the, the dream hasn't fully been realized right, yet. There's always a need for the, the, the movement right. to continue and for individuals to keep moving forward. Right. As we get very close to the end here, we do some summary. I want, Denise, I want you thinking in advance of some summary thoughts, but I want the students and everybody to hear from a, a, a fellow graduate of Sumner High School, mm -hmm. a St. Louisan, um, talking about the impact of the civil rights movement, Mr. Dick Gregory. When I first started riding planes, a black man couldn't be a pilot. A black woman couldn't be a stewardess. Hmm? A white woman couldn't be a pilot. A, a white woman couldn't be a mechanic. The only thing a white woman could do on a commercial airline, she could be a stewardess, but she had to look like something off the center page of Playboy magazine. Because of the civil rights legislation that didn't say for Negroes only, anytime you go on a plane today and see an old, ugly, short, fat, white steward, we got her that job. It came through that civil rights movement. Not through her brother, not through her daddy, not through the Marines. We did. Denise, kind of an important thing to think about when you think in terms of the impact of the movement entirely. He's right. It wasn't specifically a racist -centered, racial centered piece of documentary. It's had wide ranging impacts. You've had a little perspective on it as a result of this project and other works obviously you do in your capacity at Washington University in the field of social work. If I were to give you 30 seconds, which I'm going to give you now, and you wanted to like, uh, give you a nice encapsulation, what would you tell these kids? What do they think about as they move out into the weirdo world? How can they carry the spirit forward? What would you want them to think about? Well, I would say that uh, history or civics is not just something, not just a class. It's not something you read in a book. It's uh, something that actually you, you live. History is your legacy, is our legacy to you. All of history is our legacy to you. Uh, and it's your turn to take up that mantle and start making history. It's your responsibility, it's your privilege, it's your right to understand that you are part of history, that you can make history. 50 years ago this week, Muhammad Ali became the youngest uh, heavyweight champion of the world at 22 years old. Of course, he had to work hard, but he proclaimed it. He said, I'm going to do this. My name will be known around the world. He worked hard for that. And you all can work hard in any field that you want to. All you have to do is choose it and do it. Take up that mantle, and what are you going to do by the time you're 40 years old to be famous, to change the world, for, to be a better place. Denise, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.